Well, actually, you know, my favorite time to come to the museum is when nobody else is here. It's a home away from home for me. There's so many stories that all these trees could tell. And I just, I love to just sort of be a fly on the wall and listen to people as they're going around the museum. And it's very exciting. I can't believe it's been 40 years. I can tell you that Dunning would be absolutely tickled to see what was going on now. We have great memories of, uh, of Donnie and his, his enthusiasm was so infectious that you couldn't help but get caught up. Even if you weren't uh, someone who was uh, familiar with the high desert flora and fauna, uh, he could get you excited in, in short order and he was just a uh, an incredible one in a million visionary. He wanted to invite people to open their eyes and see more when they're out and about. Recognize birds when they're flying, look for lizards in the rocks, and have an appreciation for just the great vastness of this special place that we call home. <laughs> We were sitting in a pile of elephant manure because it was a real cold day and the elephant manure was very warm. <laughs> and Don said, what would you think of the idea of having a, a place like the Desert Museum in Tucson, but having it, uh, having it up here in, uh, in Oregon and do the same thing? I say, that's a terrific idea. Where would you put it? And I said, Bend. In the early 80s, Bend was, uh, was just coming out of being a timber and, and lumber town. The mills closed, the millwork companies closed. Uh, the economy really went south. No, it was a tough time. I mean, Don Kerr called and he had this really passionate interest in starting what he called then the Oregon High Desert Museum. And it was a very interesting idea. Uh, Economically, it was a tough time to start anything in Bend. But land and money, those were, those were the big ones. And uh, it was Don that says, I'll take care of this. Don had absolutely no fear of going and talking to anybody. And of course, he made more and more contacts so that uh, finally when we would give presentations, we'd have a room full of people. He was not a, a charismatic appearing person. He was not a great public speaker. He mumbled a lot. Not at all a prototype of what you would expect of a huge successful fundraiser. Um, but it was his, his focus and his passion for this institution and what he saw in the future that I think inspired an awful lot of people to, to support him. The actual preliminary design of the museum we did on my living room rug. The thing is, I had designed this whole thing, and I went, oh my God, now we've got to build it. <laughs> he called me at about 11 o'clock on Monday morning and said, hi, I'm Don Kerr, I'm starting a museum. We've got a small museum and we're gonna do a big expansion and would you be interested in talking to me about being the architect. And I said, I'll be there in three hours. Yep, he was. <laughs> I really believed in making a building that would fit into the landscape, made out of the materials from the landscape. Mm -hmm. And Don was really excited about that. And so we had this, you know, very similar vision of making a building that began to tell the story about the landscape before you even went into it, right? Simple idea. Beautifully inspired idea. These walls were built by these guys going out in their pickup trucks and picking up truckloads of these rocks from the site. Don was really, really engaged in the design. That was a big thing for him. 
I mean, he wasn't just a manager in that way. He was like in it, creatively, you know, emotionally. And what I realized with Don was that he understood that museums are about discovery. They're about learning something, discovering something in a way that has to be active. You let them touch things, you let them pull on things, you know, you let them become a part of something that gives them a personal, direct understanding of what they're dealing with. I think one of the things that was so profound about the way that he approached the work was to make sure that visitors are emotionally connected to, to the experience. And when you have that emotional connection, it's, it's a way to care about something and to recognize it. And I think that's one of the things that the museum does really well is raises and heightens your awareness of the subtleties of the high desert and the landscape. And Don knew how to do that so well. A museum like this helps show what, what happened in the past. And we, and we have to remember that past tribal people here, you know, we've been here for thousands of years. The work the museum's doing with the community, getting tribes more involved in and looking at what the exhibits are, what is, uh, you know, uh, respectful for the tribes. It's exciting work. It's good work. I, I think it's important and uh, I, I've been blessed to be a part of it. In 1990, we finalized a long process of deciding that the Doris Swayze Bounds collection would come here to the High Desert Museum. And it was really the happy conclusion of a long and deliberate process. Um, and the happiest thing about it, I think from most of my family's perspective, was that we were able to find a, a high quality institution in Oregon that would be able to house the exhibit on a permanent basis. And to remember and celebrate the stories and the great achievements in artistry and endurance um, that her collection tells. We also have an opportunity to look forward to how we can expand accessibility and allow more and more perspectives to be shared with new visitors to the museum. I'm so grateful that we have come as far as we have in making Don and Doris's vision a reality. I think one of the iconic moments from visiting here as a child is that immersive aspect of the exhibitions that you're put into a place and a time with audio and objects that surrounds you and takes you to a different place. And that's something that, that this museum does extraordinarily well. Well, when we were, when we were designing exhibit, the, the Spirit of the West, we wanted it to be immersive. Finding everything was, was a bit of a challenge. For instance, the characteristic of Wells Fargo buildings in those days were these iron shutters that you see. And, uh, you know, I didn't want us to end up the newspaper, High Desert Museum, loots iron shutters from old gold rush town. And uh, a fellow in town, downtown ornamental iron, he's still in business. We sat down and he built them. And we've never had anyone not think they were the real thing. So it was finding a lot of people beyond the regular staff who bought into the, what the museum was doing. This has become the largest art museum east of the Cascades in Oregon. I mean, it really is a center for art and culture. And to move into things like Imagine a World and some of these communities like Rajneeshpuram, that wasn't that long ago, but yet 90% of the people who live in Bend weren't around when Rajneeshpuram was active. So to show them what was actually happening then, I think is important. So I, I'm, I'm all for some of those, what might appear to be riskier exhibits. I think it's a very unique place where it has combined the cultural and the natural history. And I don't know of, I mean, there are marvelous museums throughout the West, but I don't know of another that does that and has the landscape to, to tell the story also. I mean, we've all had that experience of finding something in a library, for instance, or something in a, you know, in a museum or in a classroom where it actually changes your life, that you understand that you have an interest in something. And in whatever ways, sometimes subtle, sometimes really dramatic, 
it helps you sort of grow and continue, you know, to find the meaning. Everybody needs to sense a meaning in their own lives, right? And these kinds of places help you do that. You can see the live exhibits of the otters of the birds of prey. When you walk through the exhibit of the minor shack and the teepees of the Native Americans, it's a three-dimensional, ongoing, exciting opportunity for all ages to appreciate what is the history of this region. And I, uh, I take my hat off to the ongoing momentum that Donnie left because the leadership has done a fabulous job in making sure that the future of the High Desert Museum continues on. Don in particular, I think instilled the feeling among all the people who came after him that oh, we're not gonna compromise. If, we're, if we can't do it right, we're not gonna do it at all. And I think that's been consistent uh, over the years and particularly under Dana's leadership. 40 years later, the vision for the museum remains profoundly similar <laughs> to how he created uh, this place, uh, inspiring moments of wonder and awe. And that doesn't go away. That is still true, whether you're walking into a gallery with indigenous futurism or wandering down to the otter habitat, those core principles of his vision remain true. When you go out into the community and I, you think, I think that I don't know anybody very much, and then you bump into people who've been at the museum and they, keep, they say thank you. We love the museum. He had a little dream that became a very large dream and is bigger than he ever, ever, ever expected it to be. I would say he'd be very filled up with gratitude and uh, pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>